reminder, the Smithsonian project is due on Monday. Let me know if there's some issue where you can't get it done in time. But in general, good to get it over with. Uh, you can go during the week if your schedule allows. Uh, understand that they're not open like late. So you check your off the hours before you head down. But it is free. Uh, Smithsonian is free to people. So. All right, so we've been looking at issues of dinosaur biology. And so last couple lectures, we've looked at dinosaur behavior and dinosaur senses and locomotion. And now we get an extremely cute lecture, a lecture that's got some cute pictures in it. And that has to do with what is always the most critical part of any sort of biology, and that is the fact that you have another generation. So eggs and babies, without which the species is extinct. So this is going to be looking at dinosaur, fa dinosaur families and growth. So the discovery of dinosaur nests um, goes back to the early part of the 20th century. There were fragments of dinosaur eggs that were found earlier, but people weren't entirely certain that they were dinosaurs rather than some other extinct reptiles. It turns out, subsequently, they did turn out to be dinosaurian eggs. But the first real dinosaur nests were discovered in the 1920s in Mongolia by the Central Asiatic Expeditions of the American Museum of New York. Um, and there is one such nest. They attributed the nests to Protoceratops because in that particular formation, the Judocta formation, Protoceratops is by far the most common body fossil of a dinosaur, and so that made a lot of sense. Subsequent expeditions in the 1990s showed that no, that was actually incorrect. Those were oviraptor as eggs. We do have Protoceratops eggs. I'll talk a bit about them coming up. There were additional discoveries of dinosaur nests made in various parts of the world since then, in India, China, uh, Mongolia again, uh, and famously in the US and Canada. And for instance, here is a nest of the Eumanuraptor and the Dinodinosaur truodon. Actually, it's half the nest. They, they split it open, and half the nest is actually back at the museum. But the step part still out in the field. Uh, we've got hadrosaur nests. These are um, from a concentrated uh, 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 nest colony called Egg Mountain. So the eggs of Myasaura, who incidentally is the dinosaur featured here. Um, and indeed, a lot of the modern study of dinosaur eggs and babies stems from that work at Egg Mountain and work largely started by this guy when he was um, a grad student. Um, and that's uh, John Horner. He goes by Jack Horner. He is the, well, well, he was the consultant for the Jurassic Park series for most of its original uh, run. Um, he has since stepped down from that. There's a younger guy who does it now. Uh, he is the inspiration for Dr. Grant in the Jurassic Park series. Um, and he actually shows up on screen in one of the movies in the background, although not as a scientist, as a, as a raptor handler. And in the 1970s, he and a colleague of his were driving around in Montana, where a person who ran a local shop um, showed him bones like these. Little bones, uh, they had them in a can, and they said, uh, you know, we found these out in the field. Um, can you tell us what they were? And uh, Jack was able to recognize that they were the bones of very, very small, and based on the condition of the the ends of the bones and the bone texture, very, very young dinosaurs, possibly even embryos. And when he asked, you know, where did they find them, they he went out, uh, they went out there, they, they looked at the site and discovered it was a nesting colony. And then a brand new uh, hadrosaurine that eventually he named Myasaura, the good mother lizard. Um, and this was sort of the beginning of a lot of studies of nests, eggs, growth, parenting, and a lot of themes that tied together. And he and his students have been some of the major figures in that field, although people from all over the world have contributed to it. Uh, here, at, uh, nearby the sites, in you know, other spots in, in Montana, here is an egg with, uh, with bones of the embryo inside of Trudon, of the Trudontid. 
Here's an as yet unnamed, and, or as an un yet an uncertain species of Lapiosauri, uh, and so forth. Myasaurus, though, gets a lot of the attention because they found literally hundreds, if not thousands, of nests. They have since found herds of these things. They found eggs. They found embryos in the eggs. They found hatchlings. They have adults. Um, and at other sites where they found these um, mass death sites, they've got the entire range of the population. So we have a lot of information about the growth cycle of Myasaurus. This is the old mount uh, at the Museum of the Rockies as it existed in the, in the 90s. Uh, and it's sort of like Clive Barker's mother, uh, sort of a Clive Barkerish look at, uh, at motherhood. So we've got a parent, we don't know if it's a mother or a father, you know, helping on the babies, but they're all skeletons. Um, and since people have studied the eggs and babies from around the world, from almost every sort of type of science you can imagine, to help put together a picture of the different styles of the life of dinosaurs. Now, I said most here, and that's not actually correct, as we'll see. Some, some dinosaur eggs have crispy shells, that is, calcified shells, like a bird, rather than leathery shells like lizards or snakes or the majority of turtles and so forth. Another reason we know that is when we find the preserved eggs, typically what we're finding is the calcified shell, whether it is eggs lacking embryos, or those, if you're really lucky, where this embryo was developed enough that its bones were beginning to ossify, to turn to bone, and therefore were preservable. Uh, but not all. For instance, here is one where the egg isn't preserved as well, but the interior is. Now, the, when I talked about amniotic eggs to begin with, you know, the colonization of land, uh, when amniotes first came on land, the ancestral state for the shell was not a crispy shell like we see like with a chicken egg. It was a leathery or parchment shell, and that is, remains widespread among living amniotes. So mammal eggs are like that for those mammals that still lay eggs. The vast majority of squamates, those are snakes and other lizards, snakes phylogenetically are a type of lizard, there are, some, there are some lizards that have crispy shells, but they are derived within lizards. Tuataras, so they're the sister group of squamates. They had a long history in the Mesozoic. They were far more diverse than today. They have leathery shells. And the vast majority of turtles have leathery parchment shells. Although, again, there's a couple groups of turtles, derived groups of turtles that have crispy shells. In contrast, 100% of living archosaurs have crispy shells. So crocodilians and aves, living birds. So, we were perfectly comfortable and happy. It was nice back in the days, long, long ago, when we would look at this data and say leathery parchment shell ancestral for amniotes, Calcitic shells present in living archosaurs, simplest level of inference is that calcitic shells were present ancestrally at the base of archosauria, especially given the fact that calcitic eggshells were confirmed in dinosaurs. We've had titanosaur eggs since the 1800s. These are some of those eggs that were only later discovered to be dinosaurs for certain. And we have other titanosaur eggs that are confirmed as titanosaurs. Hadrosaurids, both lambiosaurines and hadrosaurines. And a wide variety of tetanurian theropods, including megalosauroids, allosauroids, a bunch of various sorts of manuraptorins, and of course all living dinosaurs have calcitic eggshells. That was nice. That was comfortable. You know, here's an example of an oviraptorosaur. We see the either very late stage embryo that got separated from its egg during fossilization or a hatchling that died in its nest. Uh, Skimming the name baby long, baby dragon, but um, you know, it didn't, it, the species actually grew up full size and it's surrounded by calcitic eggs. However, there was one fly in the ointment. In this case, it's a fly in the sense that it flies too. Uh, it's pterosaurs. 
Pterosaurs, remember, are a type of ornithodiamond archosaur. They are dinosaurs' weird flying cousins. And they were known to have leathery shells. They happen to have been preserved in some circumstances. Uh, and so we can actually see that they have the leathery shell. That wasn't super crazy. People thought, well, maybe they reduced the amount of shell um, because they're flyers. And so in order to keep flying up until the point they laid their eggs, maybe they're reducing the weight. You know, we actually have entire nesting colonies of pterosaurs, so we can confirm that. Um, there's a, a reconstruction. Here's one of the photographs of the specimens. You can see these collapsed parchment the eggs. And so, back in the day, long, long ago, and the, the joke is it's going to be it's really not that long ago, it was simple. Crocodilians have crispy shells. Birds have crispy shells. We can confirm crispy shells in the rest of dinosaurs, or at least where we have the eggs. So it was a reversal to get to Pterosauria. Up until the last time I taught this course, 2019, that was fine. But between then and last fall, when I taught the honors version of the course for the last time, things change. Now, we should have expected that. People didn't highlight the status of the eggshell for these specimens, although these specimens had been around for a while. In fact, I'd seen some of these in person on display. People hadn't really studied the eggshell of this. This is a, a um, core prosauropod, Massospondylus. I showed you this before when I talked about the ontogeny there. It turns out that the shell preserved with these specimens is not crispy. It is a preserved version of the parchment shell. And along comes 2020, and it turns out that it's not alone. That there are other dinosaurs that have parchment shells. That was Massospondylus. It turns out another, more derived, a, a near sauropod, Musaurus, also has leathery shells. It turns out that freaking Protoceratops, the one who we used to think, laid those eggs in the Shadakta, that were actually only raptor eggs. When we found their eggs, it turns out they're leathery eggs. And so, freaking 2020, man, it sucked in all sorts of ways, including taking something that was once super simple and now making it complicated. Because given the data we have, either you have four known reversals or four convergent evolutions of crispy eggs. And so you weight these out with par parsimony, and it says, did we squat? It says, you can't tell. It says, it's ambiguous. So if you use parsimony-based phylogenetics, it tells you, we don't know, man. We don't know what the ancestral archosaur egg was. And you use Bayesian, and I didn't go into the distinction there. Bayesian is a more... Um, Likelihood-based method in terms of estimating phylogeny. It tells you, in fact, that leathery is ancestral. And that happens because you can actually incorporate time data better there. And we've got these uh, early Jurassic forms that have the leathery shell that weights in that direction. So we don't know. 2020. Yeah. So one of these days, it, as, we, as we sort of fill in some of these question marks, you know, I just have exemplars here, but there could be other tabs in there. Maybe it will weight it more strongly one way or the other, but we'll see. Okay. Now, dinosaur eggs. Whether they're leathery shell or crispy shell, the largest known ones are no more than two liters volume. That's big. It's not as big, and by the, I mean, in this case, I mean Mesozoic dinosaur eggs. There are actually extinct modern birds who eggs were slightly larger than this. And the fun thing is that some of these four liter eggs are from titanosaurs. So the largest land animals that have ever lived, or among the largest land animals that have ever lived, nevertheless had eggs about the size of a soccer ball. So some of these are, the, this is a, a, a giant oviraptorosaur, something like Gigantoraptor. This is a titanosaur, these are hadrosaurs, and so forth. Um, you know, these clutches found in all sorts of different styles. But um, yeah, 
So there weren't, you know, the old-fashioned uh, caveman movies, you know, comedy caveman movies or something, or time travel movies, often comedy. So you have your dinosaur eggs as big as a person, and a hat cracks open, and the baby comes out as big as a human being, or bigger. No, that's not real. An egg can't be that big. Structurally, it wouldn't hold together. Four liters, or a little more than that, five or six liters, looks like it's about it. Beyond that, either the shell has to be too thick and it can't breathe, or the shell is so thin it collapses under its own weight. So you've got a limitation there on how big uh, an egg can be. All right. And so that's an important thing to remember. Even the very largest dinosaurs came from babies smaller than you. What dinosaurs were small? All dinosaurs were small when they were born. And that's an important distinction, as we'll see later on. That's not true in placental mammals. So eggs don't exist alone. They exist in clutches. Those are the eggs laid during one interval. They're not simultaneous. Sometimes it takes days for them to lay the eggs in the clutch. And they're laid in nests. So we can look at what the nests and clutches are like for the two extant archosaur groups. In crocodilians, their clutches typically is about 20 to 50, depending on the species. And most have nests that look like this. What they do is they dig a hole in the ground, they lay their eggs in the, hole, uh, uh, in the, in the dirt, and cover it with vegetation. And the vegetation a palm keeps the eggs protected, and it keeps them warm. It keeps them insulated, and the rotting of the vegetation generates heat to keep them there. So alligator, crocodilus, gabialis, those are representatives of the three clades of extant crocodilians. In contrast, within Aedes, within living birds, the clutches range from about 1 to 20 eggs, depending on the species, the vast majority are closer to 1 than to 20. The basal avian lineages are ground nesters. So they build nests on the ground. Derived ones, although numerically the more common sort, but derived ones like songbirds and, and raptors and so forth, raptors in the sense here of, of hawks and falcons and so forth, they build nests up, up in trees, of course. Most Birds are brooders. What's a brooder? A brooder is one where the mom and or the dad lies on top of the eggs and keeps them warm. It's their body heat that keeps the eggs warm. And therefore, the nests are open to the air when the parent isn't there. Now, there are a few groups of birds, not many, but a few, which are mound builders. They build nests essentially the same way crocodilians do. They dig a hole in the ground, they lay the eggs, they pile vegetation on top of the eggs, and they wait until the babies are ready to hatch to excavate the babies out. And of course, bird nests can be super elaborate, uh, but these are highly derived bird nests. So the actual eggs are in the upper chambers, and these are, are built in part to dissuade snakes from getting up in there and eating the baby birds. Now. When we look, and I talked about this before, when I talked about uh, archosaurs in, in general, when we look at extant archosaurs, we see the shared behavior of nest attendance and parental care in modern archosaurs. So the parents, at least one parent, watches out over the nest. That's not true of most other sauropsids. Lizards don't watch out over their nests. Snakes don't, for the most part. Turtles don't, for the most part. The crocodilians do. Birds do. But it's more than that. When the babies are born, at least one parent, sometimes both parents, watch out over the young. They provision the young. They bring food to the young. That was not appreciated for crocodilians until recently. But of course, we long know that about birds. And in both crocs and birds, there's generally several weeks of parental care. In some cases, it can go months. Now, in the case of modern birds, most modern bird species, 
achieve full body size within the first year. In fact, many of them achieve full body size within several months. So that's basically parental care throughout their entire childhood. In the case of crocodilians, that's not true. They're definitely nowhere near full body size after a few months. But they move out of a phase where they're dependent on the parents to find food and eventually have made their way up to a size where they can fend to some degree for themselves, although they are on the menu of many other animals like herons and so forth. So, with the caveat that we've already seen that this line of argumentation can be falsified, the simplest solution is that vegetation nests and weeks-long care of the young is ancestral for Arthosauria and would have been present in extinct members of both the crocodilian lineage, Pseudosuchia, and the bird lineage, Ornithodira. Now, weeks-long care of young, at least weeks, typically months, sometimes longer, is also present in Mammalia. That is almost certainly convergence. There aren't a lot of good evidence yet for nests in extinct members of Pseudosuchia. There, so far, are really only some possible nests from Italy that might have been made by aetosaurs. Aetosaurs are these armored, herbivorous, triassic Pseudosuchians, sort of Thyreophora Mark I, or the beta version of, of Thyreophora. Um, so the crocodilian or the crocodile line attempts to do armored dinosaurs. Well, they're not dinosaurs, it's a croc line. Um, and it is not entirely certain that's what these structures are. But that's what they're in interpreted to be. And they seem to have been uh, nests that were made in mud with a raised rim wall and mixed in with some vegetation. So presumably they would have had vegetation on top of it as well. In contrast, dinosaurian nests are actually pretty common. We've got lots of non-avian dinosaur nests from many different clades. Some are open-topped. Some are lined with vegetation and probably were covered with vegetation. And I'll show you one of the ways we can use now to uh, to infer that as well from the eggs themselves. And at least in the case of Heteroptera, we have direct evidence of brooding from the cases of, uh, of fossils of parents found on top of the nests. So here is a, an Oviraptorosaur on top of its nest. So here are, is the nest of Trudon. Uh, almost certainly the parents would have been on top of it as well. The eggs are partially buried. Uh, Non-avian dinosaurs, even close to the origin of birds, like Trudon still had their eggs partially in the sediment, uh, but covered by a, a rim around with vegetation and uh, the parents on top of it. Now, there was one sort of dinosaur that did something rather different. And that is we have found multiple instances where titanosaurs actually had geothermal nests. Now, what's that? We have an example in the modern world, for instance, among Galapagos tortoises, among some, um, some iguanas, including some of the Galapagos iguanas, um, and some other, animals, some other uh, reptiles, where they don't brood their nest, but they take advantage of local geothermal sources they bury their eggs in, um, in soil that's being warmed by geothermal activity, like volcanoes, and that helps the eggs develop faster. And it turns out there are several titanosaur nest sites that are associated with geology that shows they were geothermally active at the time, which is pretty cool. And so here we see you know, an example of geothermal warming for these eggs, as opposed to mound building um, so, different options in terms of the sedimentology of these nests. Additionally, we have found that many dinosaur groups 
Hadrosaurids, titanosaurs, and several sorts of theropods are found to have nested in colonies. And the way we can recognize that is on the same sedimentary bedding plane, so the sediments that were generated at the same time, nests of multiple individuals. And it turns out these nests are often spaced about one adult body length apart. And if you've ever seen footage of like a seabird nesting colony on a nature show, maybe you're lucky enough to go and see one in real life, you've seen that's about the spacing they do. And as I talked about when we talked about behavior, you know, an advantage of that is having more eyes available to look out, not only to protect yourself, but maybe to protect your nests. You know, uh, a myosaurus might see the truodon coming along, going there to try to grab a baby and chase it off or yell at it or something. In fact, we have evidence of nest site fidelity, or at least within species, nest site fidelity. So what's that? Nest site fidelity is going back to the same spot again and again, and using it multiple times for nests. We see that in many uh, colony birds today. What we, so the evidence for that is we have older truodont nests so this is the sequence of they lay a set of eggs, the eggs hatch, you know, the babies have gone all faster or whatever, more sediment accumulates, they excavate it out again and lay new eggs in there, but some of the old evidence is down there. The question is, we don't know the level of timing between this nest, between the, the uh, nests one through three A, which is the same nest, and four. Is it one year? In that case, it could be the same individuals. Is it 10,000 years? We don't know. Sedimentation in ter the terrestrial realm is not constant. So we don't know how much time is actually represented between them. So we have evidence that the same species is coming back to use it again. But we can't confirm it's the same individuals. So that would be true nest site fidelity. is going back to the same spot and using that same location again to nest again. Now, in order to brood a nest, it has to be exposed, it has to be open, so you can get on top of it. And so this is that specimen I showed you before from the other direction. We're now looking on it basically dorsally. The upper part of the specimen, oh, by the way, nicknamed Big Mama, although it turns out probably Big Papa, that's what we'll talk about, uh, had eroded away. They saw parts of the bone sticking out, so they were able to excavate it. So the, you, don't, you don't see the vertebrae, you don't see the ribs, you see the gastralia down here, those are the sternal plates, looking at it from above. So that's tibia, metatarsus, toes, metatarsus, toes. That's um, the ischium coming back. And uh, there's one arm and there's a partial part of the other arm. And then the, the eggs are around it. Now, by comparison with modern amniotes, and by looking at the distribution where known of brooders in the fossil record, people have discovered that there's an interesting relationship between the pore size, the porosity of the eggshell, so what's the density of pores in the egg, and whether the nest is open or closed. So we see, see two extremes here. Those cylinders are, this is like you take the eggshell and you expand it out. And how, how frequent are the pores on the eggs? And so it's discovered that those with a high frequency, a high density of, por of pores, so a high porosity, tend to be covered nests. And I think that makes sense. Those nests are under vegetation. Having greater flow through the shell is going to be more important than those which are at least exposed to the air directly sometimes. So brooding nests, brooders, open nests, tend to have a lower porosity. And so these are the known living animals. So these, for instance, would include crocodilians, but also some of those mound-building birds. And then on top of that, you can place the fossil animals. And it turns out... that the eggs of known humaniraptorans, or so known paraviens, paraviens, is the term I was using, 
So Obiraptorosaurs and, and Umani raptorids are with the brooders, which we'd expect because we've also found them that way. Whereas Titanosaurs and um, Hadrosaurs plot as being mound builders. Not a surprise. I think it would seem unreasonable to think that a two ton Hadrosaur or a 25 ton Titanosaur would actually sit on its eggs. That's a quick way to go extinct because uh, it wouldn't be any more babies. And so we see this general picture that mound building seems to be ancestral, that we switch over to um, brooding when we get to Penoraptora, so Oviraptorosauria and Eumaniraptora. And that's the normal condition except for this one weird batch of extant birds, the megapodes, those are the mound building birds, who sort of reverted in that context. And so that no brooding in non panoraptorans and brooding in panoraptora. And think about that. What happened at panoraptora? We saw the reorientation of the forelimb, the sideways oriented shoulder joint. We had big penaceous feathers on the arms. So those are very good things to cover your nest with, as they do in either life. So, in fact, studies looking at oviraptorosaur nests show that they typically have a hollow space in the middle. That's where the parrot would sit. And the size of that space in the middle for the parrot seems to scale to the body size of the parrot. Not a big surprise. So you get giant forms like Gigantoraptor and baby long, and they have proportionally a much bigger volume in the middle of it, and then a ring of eggs, and that smaller ones have a smaller space in the middle. By the way, if you ever go up to the Maryland Science Center in Baltimore, they have one of these uh, giant Oviraptorosaur nests, or rather a plastic cast of it that you can get on top of, and you can pretend like you're rooting it. So. Now, what parent is sitting in the middle? Many people would default to think it's the mother, or that it's biparental. Um, maternal protection of the offspring is fairly common. They're, after all, the ones that lay the eggs. Um, also, biparental is not uncommon. Many modern species of birds have biparental brooding. So, in fact, that really helps, because that way one parent can go off and feed and also get um, food after the eggs have hatched for the babies, while the other one's protecting them, and then they can switch off. But there are modern birds and curiously, they tend to be clustered in the basal branches of extinct birds, sorry, of extant birds, where it is, that's not a typo, that is paternal care. Although it could easily be a typo for parental. Paternal care, care by the dad. That is a dad cassowary. The moms do not protect the young. The moms do not stay with the eggs. In these particular groups, actually, what happens is each nest all the eggs have the same dad, but they have multiple mothers. So the dad builds a fancy nest. He shows off to the females to show how awesome he is. If the females are pressed, they'll mate with him. They'll lay some eggs. And then another mother, a potential mother, comes along, is also oppressed, mates with them, and puts the eggs down. And so you wind up with a larger volume of eggs at that site that a single mom could produce as one clutch. And so we find that um, the total volume of eggs in a paternal care site is larger than a biparental care or a maternal. Because a maternal site or a biparental site, all the eggs come from one mom. In a, parental, so in a paternal care site, the eggs come from multiple moms. And when Examined here, it was found that the eggs of Oviraptorosaurus and Eumaniraptorans, or rather the nests of Oviraptorosaurus and Eumaniraptorans, scale to paternal care rather than biparental or maternal care by either birds or crocs. So it looks like at the base of Panoraptora, there were there was paternal care of the young that persisted all the way up through the base of 80s 
when it switched over to being mostly biparental or maternal care. So uh, this is just Benny Raptora, but this would actually be better, Henna Raptora. Paternal care of the young, and then switching over to biparental or maternal, uh, or occasionally uh, parental among derived birds. Now, okay, so you got the eggs, the eggs hatch. What happens with the babies? Well, there's two ends of the spectrum, and they tend to be concentrated more towards the ends of the spectrum than the middle, in terms of the condition of babies after the eggs hatch. There are animals which we call altricial, or nest-bound. These are animals which typically have poorly formed joint surfaces, and those bones of hadrosaurids that Jack Horner saw in the 1970s looked to him to show very poor nest uh, joint surfaces and suggested to him that these babies were nest-bound, that they were altricial. Altricial babies, of course, need the parents to provision them because they can't go off and feed on their own. They're utterly helpless. Examples today, most tree-dwelling birds are altricial. Think of robins and so forth, hawks. Marsupials are incredibly altricial. I mean, they're bored, not fully formed. They don't have hind limbs yet. Carnivorous mammals, think about them. kittens, puppies, bear cubs, totally helpless at birth. And we primates, baby primates, like humans and monkeys and apes and so forth, totally helpless at birth. The parents have to watch out for them. We're not so much nest-bound, but we are at least mom-bound or parent-bound. In contrast, the other condition is called precocial. And it's called precocial because we got to name it. So from our point of view, those are, they're ahead of the game. But in fact, they're the normal ones. We are delayed in terms of our reproduction. This is the primitive condition, and that is to have well-developed joints. And it looks like, for instance, that many raptorin babies were pre precocial, that when the eggs hatched, the babies could get up and move around. Modern examples of that, essentially all non-dinosaurian reptiles, baby crocs, baby turtles, baby snakes, baby lizards, can all move around after hatching. Ground-dwelling birds, I think about chickens and turkeys. Within minutes, they're up and peeping around and walking. Baby ostriches, baby rheas, baby emus. And hoofed mammals. So think about a baby elephant, a baby horse, a baby cow. You know, within minutes, or at least within an hour, they're up on their hind feet, on all their feet, rather, moving around. It's unsteady at first, but not too long after that, they're, they're moving around. By the end of the first day, they might be running. Not well, but they're running. So this is the ancestral condition, this precociality. Now, there have been many occasions where people have found lots of baby dinosaurs buried together. And this has raised a question, a hypothesis, maybe that was a particular lifestyle they had, that they lived together as pods, or like, you know, teens in a, in a shopping mall back in the old days, moving together as a pack. However, there's a question of taphonomy here, a question of preservation. Is it that we're finding these babies together because they were together as a group and there was no parent with them, or is it that they're married together as a group and the parents aren't found with them because the parents were big and therefore weren't buried under those conditions? When that flood happened, when that sandstorm hit, the parent could shake it off, lost the clutch, but could go off and do its own thing. And this is a hard one to recognize for certain, to tease that out. So this is, for instance, as you see, it's a bunch of protoceratops babies found together. Now, one thing that is interesting is we have at least two separate hatchings represented here in these baby stethosaurus. By aging the individuals, we could find that they represent two different ages. We'll get to a bit about how we figure out their ages. Now, Baby dinosaurs are indeed small, and they often lack the derived traits of the adult. So here is a baby labiosaurine, 
But you'd be hard pressed looking at it to say lambiosaurine or hadrosaurine is as if you recognize that it was a hadrosaurid. And there's the adults, and just so you don't miss it, that's that baby. So you can see radical difference in size between the babies and the adults, which is something radically different between dinosaurs and placental mammals. A baby placental mammal, like a ele baby elephant, is you know, 100 kilograms or more, 220 pounds or more. When it's born, it's one of the biggest animals in the Serengeti. A baby elephant-sized sauropod could fit in a soccer ball. A baby sauropod the so of a species the size of a herd of elephants could fit in a soccer ball. So they've got a lot of growing to do. And that affects dinosaur biology in many ways. For one thing, it affects their ecology. Dinosaurs undergo a condition we don't see very much in mammals, we don't see very much in modern birds, but we see in many other types of animals, especially things like other reptiles, which is called an ontogenetic niche shift. When you go from being a tiny little creature to a super giant, you go through many different sizes, and different sized individuals will have very different ecology. A tiny little baby sauropod cannot be a tree feeder. A meter-long baby tyrannosaur cannot be an apex predator. So much like some modern reptiles, the food that they eat, the way that they travel, would change over time. Now, this can be mitigated somewhat if there's extensive parental care over the space of years. And in some cases, like for instance, hadrosaurids and uh, ceratopsids, there does seem to be herd going behavior, and that could mitigate that somewhat, because the babies are traveling with the parents. But we don't have strong evidence for that in, say, stegosaurs or tyrannosaurids or things like that. So those babies are living different lifestyles as they get older which leads to an interesting aspect about dinosaur ecology compared to mammal ecology. It's something that was recognized by various researchers. It was given a name by my friend and colleague, Mike Brett Sermon there, called niche assimilation. And it's the observation that large dinosaurs pass through multiple orders of magnitude, literally orders of magnitude, we're talking about mass, and therefore they take up what are effectively multiple niches if we compare them to, say, a mammalian fauna. So in a mammalian community, say the Serengeti, if we look at the hoof mammals, we would have little diptychs, tiny little antelopes. And there would be various other mid small and mid-sized antelopes, so sort of the midpoint we get um, zebras, and then larger antelopes above that, and then uh, giraffes and rhinos all the way up to the bush elephant. And in most of those cases, they are fed, fed milk for the most part, by the, the parents, by the moms, until they can live as an adult. There isn't a radically different behavior for a baby giraffe and an adult giraffe, or a baby zebra and an adult zebra. And yet, if you were to go to the end of the Cretaceous in Western North America, there's a single species of hadrosaur that occupies all those body sizes. And in fact, that's even bigger than a big elephant. And so people had noticed before that the number of species in a dinosaur fauna is typically smaller than the number of species in a Cenozoic mammalian fauna. Even when we're just looking at the fossil record, you know, excluding the fact that in the modern world we could see all these other forms. And that's likely because the dinosaurs are effectively ecologically multiple. Each species is effectively multiple species if you compare them to a mammal. So here it is. Fewer species of large dinosaurs existed compared to Cenozoic mammal faunas because each big dinosaur species was functionally equivalent to multiple mammal species. Now, how did the babies change as they got older? If we look. At some dinosaurs, the young look a lot like the adults. So in this case, 
we see baby, uh, some baby mammals, and a baby Rapagosaurus, which is a titanosaur. It's actually quite a small titanosaur, as titanosaurs go. But the babies are quite small. And so uh, here is the baby. Here's the adult. There's Christy Curry Rogers, who is the expert on the fetosaurus. Grant, the irony of someone who studies giant dinosaurs who herself is quite tiny. Um, but um, the limb proportions and even the shape of individual bones don't change much. They don't show much, much allometry in the case of Rapatosaurus. But that's not always the case. In many dinosaurs, as we saw before when we talked about locomotion, there's a lot of allometry. Here's a moderate degree of allometry in Platyosaurus, more radical levels in Hadrosaurids and Tyrannosaurids and Ceratopsids and so forth. But something I haven't talked about yet, which I'll introduce now, and we'll continue on on Friday, when we continue our look at dinosaur growth and particular dinosaur size, is how long did it take to grow up in a dinosaur? How long did it take for this baby Brachiosaurus, and that's a reconstruction of the skeleton, to grow up to be an adult Brachiosaurus? That's a good question. In the old days, prior to the 20th century, prior to the 21st century, we had different thoughts. One, if we thought dinosaurs were something like mammals, it probably took a couple of decades to go from a little bitty baby to an adult, and then they would spend most of their life cycle as big adults. That's what we see in, say, an elephant or a rhino or a giraffe or a horse or what have you. If they were like crocodiles or tortoises, you know, the biggest living reptiles, like anacondas and so forth, it would take decades to reach adult body size, and then continue to still grow slowly. So it would take a lot longer for them to reach adult size. And in fact, they might continue to live for centuries. In both, well, both big modern and placental mammals, like rhinos and elephants, they have lifespans comparable to a human, many, many, many decades. In the case of an elephant, maybe up to a century, in the good old days when they were under such stress as they are today. Uh, in the case of big modern reptiles, a big crocodilian could be in its 50s or 60s or 70s or 80s. What about dinosaurs? Is there a way we can track their growth? Well, there is. And I'm going to introduce it now. We're going to continue with that later on. It's called skeletochronology. And it comes from the fact that most modern tetrapods form growth rings that they have a phase of accelerated growth and a phase of slow growth every year. And much like a tree ring, if you section it, you can see bands that represent the phases of slow growth. And those represent one a year, typically. And in fact, Greg Erickson, back decades before this, when he was a grad student, actually did these experiments, which he's showing there, where they put dye markers in alligators once a year, and they can track and see that those growth rings do, in fact, represent once a year, because they have these specimens. And what they did is that on occasion, they would sacrifice, that's the term we use in biology for killing, sacrifice the specimen, section its bone, look at a cross-section of its bone under a microscope, or even you know, not a microscope, too, you can see it in a naked eye, and see the bands to show once a year. And so this was a way that you could go and look at a fossil and see that this Gorgosaurus, this Tyrannosaur, was five years old at the time of death, assuming we captured all the growth lines, and that this sauropod was about 26 years old at the time of death. And what does this information tell us about their life cycle? Well, that's what we're going to pick up with next time. We'll look at dinosaur growth patterns, and from that, talk about how is it they got to be super giants.